chapter, The Sons of the American Revolution, and also the Virginia Society of the Sons of the American Revolution. The three fundamentals in the United States of America that was founded on are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Today we're going to talk about the founding of the United States and how people lived in America around 250 years ago. As we open our Patriot's chest and view items that represent past times and think of how things have changed, though those founding fundamentals shall never ever be changed. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now I want to take you back in time, over about 250 years ago. Go with me on this journey back now in time to the year 1763, more than a dozen years before the Revolutionary War would begin. The French and Indian War had just ended a long and costly war in the Ohio Valley on Virginia's western frontier. Many of Virginia soldiers took part in this war. George Washington returned home from the war to Mount Vernon, having served as commander of the Virginia Regiment during that war. Imagine what life was like with the families in Virginia during that time. For the most part, families during that time in Virginia were very hard. Virginia was a very rural, and most families lived and worked on small farms that provided just enough food and clothing for the families. They just not, not have a lot of the simple conveniences that we take for granted today. They had very little money and usually had to barter or trade for basic items. They had very little time to, uh, uh, for play or for other activities to do with the family. They hunted, fished, and grew their own food, and getting food often took up much of the time during the day. They cooked their food on open fires using iron cookware forged by a blacksmith. Let us look now in our chest at some of those items. Let's look at some of those foods that these people might have had during back during that day. We've got cornmeal, we've got salt pork, we've got pecans, Of course, oysters was a main staple in the uh, diet during back in that time. Dried beans or peas was a staple. And of course, the two main items that was had to be bought or purchased was sugar and tea. Once the food was prepared, let's look at some of the items that was on the kitchen table. If you were a wealthy Virginian, you might have some porcelain or china dinnerware perhaps some silver utensils. But most Virginians on the farm used handcrafted items made from material like wood, tin, or horn. For a heavy stew, they might use a turned wooden bowl. For meat and potatoes, they most likely used a tin or pewter plate. For utensils, they may have a twisted iron fork or a horn spoon. A cow's horn was a plastic of the day, and it was heated and pressed into a mold to make a spoon. For drinks, they normally used a tin mug or a horn cup made from a cow's horn. Most Virginians lived in modest homes or cabins they often built themselves. Many times, it was just one room for an entire family. There was a fireplace to keep the home warm in winter and open windows to cool in the summer. There was no electricity. The house was lit by a candle at night, but there was no hot showers or bath water to take a bath in like we have in our modern bathrooms of the day. They made their own furniture. Most Virginians also made their own clothes. Sheep were sheared and the wool was spun into yarn. They grew flax for linen or cotton for thread. Deer and other animals provided hides or jackets and leather for shoes. Many items that was used around the home were handcrafted from commonly available materials. After dinner in the evening when it grew dark, a tin candle holder with a beeswax candle would provide light for the home. 
Many farms had beehives for the honey and the beeswax was used for making candles. After dinner, the family might sit around the fire and the father might smoke a clay tobacco pipe and also in some cases, some of the ladies took part in that too. Pipes were made out of clay or a very common item at that time. In fact, pipe, clay pipe fragments are the most common finds in colonial archeological site digs today. The mother might sew on men clothes. Typically, a sheep was sheared once a year, and the sheep's wool fleece would be used for clothing or blankets. A sheep could produce up to five to 10 pounds of wool per year. Iron forged scissors could be used for cutting leather. A mortar and pedestal were used. They were one of the most important tools within the house, and they were used to grind, mash, or prepare herbs. For, to use for medical conditions. Many herbs were used for both for seasoning food, steeped in teas, and remedies for colds, sore throats, headaches, and other aches and pains. Doctors were very few and far between. On the family farm, farm home life and chores started early in the morning and lasted until dark. Kids were expected to help with the chores. What were some of the chores that the Kids might help with milking cows, gathering eggs, collecting firewood, hauling water, feeding animals, tending to the garden. There was little or no time for formal education back during those days, and learning took place within the home. There was not a lot of time for fun and games. Kids played with using their very simple toys. Let us look now in our chest at some of these toys the children might have played back during that day. The hardwood spinning top was the most common top in America. It could be used to play a number of different games. Two players would compete against each other to knock the tops out of a circle. Two could land the tops of a circle the most often to attempt to knock a stone out of the circle using the top. Another popular game was the wooden cup and ball toss. This game became very popular in the United States. Children in colonial America also played with clay marbles, which were rolled by hand out of clay and dried to make marbles. Children played many different types of shooting games. So what do you think? Life was hard back then, right? Would you have wanted to live back then? The truth is, although their life seems hard to us today, Many underwent great hardships to come to this country because they saw that it was a land of promise and opportunity, a chance to escape famine, disease, or even persecution. Where they came from was often a hard place. They didn't offer those things. And many today continue to look at America as a land of hope, promise, and opportunity for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But in 1763, things were about to become even more challenging. The French and Indian War had just ended a very long and expensive war. Britain had borrowed a lot of money to pay for it, and now that they had to pay the money back, where were they going to get that money from? Well, they were going to get it from the people here in America they began to tax a lot of the goods people needed to survive, such as sugar and tea and paper. What is a tax? When you buy something, it costs more because you pay something extra. It goes to the government, or in this case, during that time, was King George. The problem was they didn't ask us if we would help pay for the war. They just told us and didn't give us a choice did not have a choice or a vote. They made the decisions for us. And all of a sudden, we had to pay more for those things we needed. Most people had very little money to begin with. How do you think people during that time felt? Let's look now at some of our money that we had back during our time. Virginia was the only colony to be granted the authority to mint coins in its colonial charter. That means that they could legally mint coins for use in any of the English colonies 
Although they were granted this authority from the founders of Jamestown in 1607, they never chose to exercise this authority until 1773. The copper Virginia penny and half pence of the 1773 has the head of King George III on the front and a Virginia coat of arms on the back. Although they were authorized in 1773, they did not become available to the colonists until 1775, only a couple of months before the beginning of the American Revolution. The official currency in Virginia was the pound. Virginia paper notes, like the 1781 $250 note, were used to pay for goods and debts, although they were not really legal money. They were bills of credit backed by the colony to be paid off later. The continental dollar was actually the first coin minted in the United States in 1776. It was a pewter and only about 100 are still in existence today. Benjamin Franklin designed both sides of the coin. The back of the coin has 13 chain links with the names of each state and the words, we are one. People in Virginia were very upset by the new taxes to King George. Patrick Henry argued that this was wrong, that we should not be, ta be taxed without representation. In other words, if you want us to pay more, we should have a say in it. But Britain continued to add taxes, starting with the sugar tax in 1764, Stamp Act in 1765, the Timeshed Act in 1767, the Tea Act in 1773, and finally the Coercive Act in 1774. Tax after tax after tax. People felt like their freedom and liberty were being taken away, and they needed to do something. Not only were the British tax and colonists, but they were beginning to seize arms and take prisoners. In March of 1775, at St. John's Church in Richmond, Patrick Henry rose and said enough was enough. He said that Virginia needed to arm and prepare itself for defense. One of the major things that were done in the Northern Neck was the signing of the Leechstown Resolution. 115 signers from the Northern Neck signed that document, and they were willing to put their names on a, a most dangerous document that surely was the very beginning, the first signing against taxation. Patrick Henry, he gave a very famous speech, and he said, I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Less than one month later, on April the 19th, the first battle of the Revolutionary War took place at Lexington and Concord, he shot heard around the world. Two months later, in 1775, Congress named General George Washington the Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army. He immediately began recruiting soldiers for his army. Many of those soldiers came from Virginia. Many was the, uh, the color of the uniform that was worn in Washington's army was blue with the red uh, trim or buff with the blue uh, trim, or just basically for the militia, ordinary clothing. Let's take a look now in our truck, at our, in our chest, of the items of some of the items that the soldiers might have carried. A continental soldier carried many supplies, things like food, rations, eating utensils were carried, and even a linen haversack. They would have carried their water in a wooden canteen. They would have carried uh, their gunpowder in a horn, which carried uh, the gunpowder for their muskets. They would have carried in a bullet bag, another bullet bag. They would have carried the musket balls, which were made out of lead. Musket balls were made by melting lead and pouring into a mold and allowing them to cool. When on the march, a soldier relied on maps and a compass for direction. When in camp, soldiers used flint and strikers to start a fire. Flint were also used in the muskets. All of these supplies were very heavy. 
At the start of the war, Virginia was the oldest and the most populated in American colonies, 20% of the population. It also had the strongest economy with an enormous tobacco cash crop and accounted for almost half, 40% of all trade between the colonists and Britain. So Virginia was a very important colony and one that Britain wanted to keep on the side. At the beginning of the war, the royal governor of Virginia, Lord Dunmore, seized the colonists' gunpowder in an effort to gain control which was led to fighting for more than a year here in the state of Virginia. That all came to a head at the Battle of Great Bridge in December of 1775. Lord Dunmore had taken control of Norfolk, the largest city of Virginia, and built a fort Great Bridge. The Patriot force engaged him there in the first land battle of the war at the site. It was a great victory for the Patriots and that forced Dunmore to abandon Norfolk and ultimately leave Virginia for good, enabling the Patriots to gain control of Virginia and send troops out to the college to support Washington's army. Documents. After that, with no turning back, Shortly thereafter, on July the 4th, 1776, the unanimous Declaration of Independence of the 13 United States of America, of America echoed in the courthouses across the college. Who was the author of the Declaration? Thomas Jefferson of Virginia. Listen to these words. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are liberty, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are to institute among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute a new government. Let's take a look at our Trump narrative of some of the writing equipment used in that time. When Thomas Jefferson sat down to write these words, he just didn't pick up a pen as a paper and began writing. Nope, he, had, he would have had used a quill pen, typically used from a goose feather, that would be dipped in an inkwell. In those days, letters were written on parchment made from dried and stretched animal skin of a sheep, goat, or cow. If you were writing a letter that you wanted to keep confidential, you would seal it with wax. The seal would often be an insignia on it that identified the sender. After we declared our independence, we needed a new flag to represent us. So on June 14, in 1777, Congress passed the first flag act describing the flag of the United States. That's why today we still celebrate June the 14th as Flag Day. What did the first American flag look like? Anyone know what its name was? The Betsy Ross flag is one of the traditional most people considered as the first flag of America. George Washington is said to have taken this design to Betsy Ross in Philadelphia, suggesting a flag with six pointed stars. Betsy Ross is a seamstress suggested the design with five pointed stars because they were easier for her to cut out. As you can see, the stars are arranged in a circle representing the union of the colonies. After Virginia secured its freedom from the royal governor, Lord Dunmore, Virginia set up a new government and elected Patrick Henry as its first governor of Virginia. He would serve for three years from 1776 to 1779. During that time, most of the fighting of the revolution took place either in northern colonies of Massachusetts, New York, and New Jersey, or in the southern colonies of North Carolina and South Carolina. The British strategy was at that time to take control of major ports and cities, such as New York in the north, in Charleston and such. As month turned into years, the British were unable to win the war. Their strategy once again turned to Virginia. If they could not win the war by controlling the major urban areas, 
they would win the war by destroying the economy of the colonies. And who had the strongest economy? Virginia. In 1779, Thomas Jefferson became the governor of Virginia, serving from 1779 to 1781. It was at this time that the British began a series of invasions into our state. It culminated with the invasion of Benedict Arnold on January the 17th, 81. Arnold took his army up the James River to Richmond, the new capital of Virginia, forcing Thomas Jefferson and the government to escape. After that, he burned the city to the ground. Anyone know who Benedict Arnold was? He was a trusted general in George Washington's army who became a traitor and joined the British Army. He became one of the most despised men in America. During the American Revolution, gathering secret military intelligence was one of the most important weapons used in the war to gain an advantage. Once the information was collected, it was important to keep it a secret until it made it into the right hands. Many devices were used for concealing intelligent reports. One device was a small wafer, thin lead container in which a message was sealed. A concealment device could be any ordinary, everyday object that blended in and doesn't call in attention to itself. One example is this is a spy coin, similar to that thin lead container, holiday to hide things inside. George Washington used spies throughout the war to learn about the British activities and plans. Spies used many techniques to send secret information. They could sew important papers or plans into their clothes. They would leave messages in various locations called dead drops to be picked up at a certain time and a certain place. They used invisible ink. They would write on with uh, special codes that needed a cipher to do decode. James Armistead Lafayette. Anyone know who he might be? He was an enslaved person who joined the Continental Army and pretended to be a runaway slave. He joined Benedict Arnold's camp reporting on his activities before joining the camp of British General Lord Cornwallis. His reports were a key to helping George Washington defeat the British at Yorktown in Virginia on October the 17th, 1781, bringing an end to the long war. After a three-week siege, the British surrendered their army at Yorktown. America had secured its freedom, and Virginia played a huge part in the American Revolution. Though the leadership of Patrick Henry, Thomas Jefferson, and George Washington Patrick Henry was known as the voice for his inspiring speech, such as give me liberty or give me death. Thomas Jefferson was known as the pen for writing the Declaration of Independence. And George Washington was known as the sword, as commander in chief of the army. The voice, the pen, and the sword of the American Revolution were all from here in Virginia. They also add at this time, many hundreds of men, women, men of all races, white, black, the American Indians, supported the American cause. What was the revolution about? And what, should it never, those three ideals never be changed? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness.